All right, everyone. Good afternoon again. My name is Al Koritz. I am the Applications Manager at Electron Microscopy, and I am serving as the Master of Ceremonies today for our presentation. Allow me to introduce Dr. Gary Greenberg, the creator of the 3D panfocal microscope. Gary, take it away. Thank you so much, Al, and thank you all very much for being here today. I really appreciate it. So today we're going to talk about 3D pan focal microscopy. Uh, here is the agenda for the day. We're going to talk about what it is, how you publish results, what the benefits are of 3D, give application examples, show how to set up the system, and show you an interesting optional 3D illuminator. Um, and then we'll have some questions. So first is what is pan focal microscopy? Basically, it's a way of converting your current 2D microscope into a 3D microscope. It's easy to install, it's a plug and play system, and it gives you confocal-like results at a fraction of the price. And the advantage being you can still use your own microscope. So it's compatible with almost any light microscope. It can be upright or inverted or even a stereo microscope. Reflected light, transmitted light, fluorescence illumination, um, uh, all sorts of microscopes uh, it is compatible with. So forensic scientists really need 3D because they look at real world objects, real world evidence that is naturally 3D. So the advantage here is that you can view your specimens hundreds of microns thick and see it all in focus. You don't have to take sections and destroy parts of the specimen to see what you want to look at. So this is particularly good for something like bullet analysis, tool markings, trace evidence, document analysis fabric identification, counterfeits and forgeries, and so forth. Anything where you're dealing with a naturally thick specimen. It's easy to install, it's simple, no on-site demo is required. It basically consists of the prior scientific focus drive and the Edge 3D pan focal software, which you download onto your Windows 10 computer. Uh, so here's an example, this is a 20-year-old Olympus microscope, and essentially, the uh, pan focal software controls the camera and the focus, that's the focus drive, and it automates Z focus stacking. So let's show you an example. Here's a bullet under the microscope, uh, a, a bullet casing, and there's a bullet impression there, the firing pin impression, and now we're looking at the firing pin impression. And this is the pan focal software graphic interface, and you can see on the left side here, this is, allows you to move the stage up and down. So now, because the prior focus device is connected, you can move your stage up and down electronically. So here, you can use a slider to move it up and down, or here you can say how many microns and steps you want to move it up and down. Right now it says 10, you can put any number in there. You can use the fine focus knob or the wheel on your, on your uh, mouse to focus, or you can use the keyboard arrows to focus. There's many ways of focusing to make it really simple and accurate to focus. And as you focus, the position is shown right here on the focus position. So right now, the way it works is you start by lowering the stage to focus on the top of the specimen. So you see that was the middle of the specimen. Now we're up at the top of the specimen. And once you're there, you click set, set, I'm sorry, set current position to start. Then you focus down to the bottom of the specimen, which is way down into the bottom of this firing pin impression. And then you say set current position as the end. And now you can see it was 250 microns where the end was. Then you tell it how many, uh, what the step size is. In other words, how far apart in the microns should each picture be taken. In this case, it's a low power, uh, um, it's a 4X lens. So we're gonna do 30 microns and then it automatically figures that it's gonna be 25 pictures. And then all you do is you go down here and you push the button that says, take a stack. And in about 15 seconds later, boom, it looks like that. Now the entire end of this uh, bullet casing is in focus all the way from the top down to the inside of that well. And there's many ways you can see it now. Now it's done the stacking. So this is what we call this is a 2D view. It's a 2D view because it's a, it's a 2D projection of a three-dimensional object. Now, you can see it in many different ways in 3D, and I'm going to show you those bit different ways. You can make a model of it. You can do stereo 3D, stereo 4D, which I'll explain to that. You can make rotational films. You can do color anaglyphs, which is the red and green, uh, red and cyan glasses and so forth. Um, so 
How do you publish the results? Well, the basic way to publish results is, is similar to confocal microscopy. Uh, you, you publish a, a reconstruction of disease stat, but you can also in our system quickly publish a uh, color depth image. You can publish a stereo red green uh, or red, red cyan image. Uh, and these glasses are, are very inexpensive. They're pennies a piece. Uh, so you can show them at a, at a conference, for example. Hopefully that will happen again soon, <laughs> next year, I, I'm hoping. Uh, you can do surface profile image and you can link, make a link to a 3D motion video. So here's an example of the reconstruction of the Z-Stack. That's the most popular way of, of publishing your results. Now this is that same image turned into a color depth map. So now you see on the bottom scale, the XY scale, um, so, and, and on the top, on the right hand scale, you see the depth scale. So um, uh, you, have, you have blue at the bottom and red is coming out at you. So blue is uh, the bottom of the pit there and up to the top red, that's 750 microns, about three quarters of a millimeter. So very quickly, you get a really good idea of how you can quantify this particular bullet and uh, firing pin impression. Now here, if you, if you happen to have your 3D glasses, please put them on. You put the left eye red. And all of a sudden you will see, if you have them, how powerful the human brain is for dissecting out depth information. A huge part of our brain is devoted to be able to do this. So now all of a sudden you get information you really couldn't get otherwise. Okay, you can take off the stereo glasses now. And now here's a way of seeing it as a surface profile image. This allows you to see 3D without glasses. And you can use your mouse pad to see it in different angles and different directions. And then another way is to make a uh, rotational movie out of it. And this you can post as a movie as a link um, uh, and people can easily see it as a MP4 little video. So what are the benefits of 3D? The basic deal on 3D is, is it overcomes the depth of field problem of microscopes. Microscopes have a horrible depth of field problem. They, they only see a tiny bit in focus. And the higher power lenses you use, the higher MA lenses you use, the thinner that depth of field or that area that's in focus is visible. So that's a real problem. Because for example, if you're looking at a cell, uh, a cell is you know maybe 20, 30 microns thick, and people tend to look at five micron sections. You're, you're not even looking at a whole cell. So there are errors and sampling errors by the problem, the depth of field problem. So by looking at a 3D, you can improve your diagnosis, you can increase your productivity, because instead of making five micron sections, uh, you can make multiple, uh, uh, you can make sections of 100 microns or more. And it reveals hidden depth information you could not see otherwise. Um, 3D imaging is revolutionizing microscopy. Uh, these two companies, uh, Keyence and, Hi and Hyrox, make 3D systems. They're quite expensive, and, and, and they allow you to see uh, surface. Uh, they're mainly for surface, not for, trans not for transmitted light. Uh, our system can be for transmitted light, fluorescence, uh, reflected light. These have been very, very popular, and they're sort of uh, over, they're, 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 a lot of industry people have, uh, have drifted to buying these microscopes. But our panfocal system is a fraction of the cost of these microscopes, and you can still use your own microscope, which is a real advantage. Uh, let's say you have a setup um, on your microscope that has all sorts of accessories that you don't want to have to buy a new microscope. So it's nice to be able to use your own microscope and turn it into 3D. So here's some application examples. We'll look at bullet analysis, tool markings, trace evidence, documents, and so forth. So this is that um, that that firing pin impression that I showed you. This is this is closer in now with a closer lens, and now you can see the strike markings. Now this is in 2D, but look what happens when you stack it and see it in 3D. Now you're looking all the way down into that well, uh, all in 3D, and the and the and the markings on the firing pin are clearly visible and can be measured. And there, right there, is a 3D color depth map of that same thing. So you can now quickly and clearly measure those markings. Uh, here are four different um, uh, casings, bullet casings. Each uh, was uh, from a different from different firing arm and a different uh, firing pin. So you can see they each make a different uh, um, design uh, 
in the color depth map. So you can clearly uh, see the difference between one firing pin, sorry, one uh, bullet casing and another. Um, here's an example of a tool marking. This is a little bit of a, this is on the edge of a, 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 of a, of a, uh, of a coin, a little raised edge of a coin, and there was a tool marking on it. And now in 2D, you don't see much, but here in 3D, look, you all of a sudden really see what's happening. There's really no comparison between what you see here in 2D and what you can see here in 3D. Uh, and then again, you can quickly do a color depth map and you can measure uh, the distance, the width, the markings, uh, the height, and the depth. This is an example of uh, trace evidence. This is from a vacuum, look at the contents of a vacuum cleaner. It's a very complex image. It's hard to really tell what's happening there. But when you see it in 3D, now you can begin to see that there's hairs, there's fibers, there's a bit of a, um, uh, a, a bit of a plant material there, um, some dust, some skin cells, various sorts of things. This is an interesting thing. You know, when you write, as you most of you probably know, when you write with a, a ballpoint pen, it leaves a mark. It leaves a three-dimensional impression in the paper. So, if you were to take this, uh, this is two strikes of a ballpoint pen, and here you're seeing it in 2D. Now in 3D and, and in our um, uh, surface profiling, you can see that there's a groove that goes from left to right that's quite pronounced, uh, more pronounced than the up and down groove. But look at here, you can see, when you see it at this angle, you see it even more clearly, that the groove from left and right appears to be the second marking. And if you do a color depth map on it, that sort of verifies it because now you can see the continuous blue channel, blue is at the bottom, going across the screen, whereas the marking up and down has a has a definite um, border uh, at the top where it goes green. So the second marking was definitely the horizontal marking, not the vertical marking. Here's an example looking at a human hair root. Um, this was from the FBI, I wanted to see what these would look like in 3D. This is the normal picture that they got. This is a dappy stain using fluorescence. And now in 3D, now you see it all, the depth, you see all the cells. This, this particular stain stands for, stands for DNA. So you're seeing the nuclei of all the cells in the, in the hair, in root hair. Uh, uh, and here again is another one. There's a 2D example. And now all of a sudden you go to 3D. It just gives you more information and a deeper understanding of what's happening. That's really what we do. We provide more information and deeper understanding. Here's polarization microscopy. This is a 2D image. This is a sugar crystal that's been crystallizing on the slide for a few hours. And now that's what it looks like in 3D. Now you see it all in focus and you can see the shape of the crystal. So if you happen to have 3D glasses, Look at, 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 please put them on, put the left. I'm just going to give you a little tiny, small uh, a journey through the 3D world of microscopy. So this is an interesting picture. It's, it's paper. This is just normal printing on paper. I, I, I typed out the word 3D. I made a JPEG of it. I reduced it to the size of a period and printed it on paper and then put it under the microscope. So now you're seeing the paper is not as flat as you thought it was. You see all the little... Uh, fibers in it, you see the holes, and you see that the printing isn't flat either, that the little uh, bits of carbon, little uh, 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 carbon, the way it sort of decorates the fibers of the paper, that's actually what's happening. Here's an example of Velcro, uh, and you can see that these little hooks uh, on the one side, on the hard side of the Velcro, they grab the loops on the other side, and then when you pull them apart, you see the hooks are severed. So. Uh, and they're flexible, so they come apart and they can then come right back to their original memory position. Here's an example of uh, a circuitry, microelectronic uh, circuitry. Uh, you're seeing it all in focus and all in 3D. Here's an interesting, this is some uh, very, very fine etching on a gold plate. This is a polished gold plate. You can see the polishing marks on the gold. Uh, and then you can see all the little bits of etching and all, and you can see where the tool cut nicely and where the tool didn't cut well and how it left material behind. Here's a penny uh, from 1982. It's a little bit closer. And you really get 
an incredible, how the brain works in 3D is really remarkable, the amount of information that it gives you. Uh, there's a, a, na a fungus gnat in 3D, just a tiny, tiny little fly. This is a this is a little die cutter. That uh, that's a little part of a die cutter that stamps things out. That's the cutting edge. That's all in focus, and you can see it coming to you. Now here's something interesting. We have something very unique. It does stereo and motion 3D simultaneously. So it almost is like a it's like a hologram. It's just floating there, and you see it now. The stereo is interrogating the specimen from the left and right view, whereas the tilting is interrogating the specimen up and down view. So now you're getting a much more accurate view of what's happening, what we call 4D viewing. And here's another 4D image. You're getting the stereo view if you have your glasses on, yet you're also getting the motion view uh, at the same time, which gives you more information. So now you can remove your glasses, and uh, I want to show you how to set up the system. It's really easy to do. Essentially, uh, you, you receive the uh, the prior scientific focus drive, and it consists of a little sleeve here out at the end. Look at the bottom of this image. There's a sleeve, and that sleeve goes over your coarse focus drive. So um, different uh, sleeves are available, and, uh, and there's a list of microscopes that it's compatible with, which is almost all microscopes, and you just say which one, and then that sleeve, that correct sleeve is given to you, it's put into here. And then the motor comes in from the out from the outside and that little part there attaches to the fine focus drive and that's how it turns the fine focus drive. So here it is, that's the old Lippus microscope. That sleeve is gonna go over the coarse focus and that motor is inserted and it hits that little fine focus. So there it is attached. Very, very easy to do. Then all you have to do is download the Edge 3D panfocal software. Uh, you need a, a Windows 10 computer uh, a fairly, you know, fairly good one. It's got to have, a, you know, a decent graphics card and some good memory and some good storage space. Um, and uh, so another optional, or I should say an optional uh, accessory that you can add to the system is the 3D oblique illuminator. So this is for live cell imaging uh, and it does both 2D and 3D. It's made for imaging objects that are not stained, things like uh, live cells or, or, or microorganisms or, or, or uh, things like diatoms, things that aren't stained and you need to create contrast in order to see them. So this is the little edge uh, illuminator that Prior is making. Um, it's available now. Uh, and we're making a new, or we, we have some left and we're making a new shipment right now. Uh, so this illuminator can go either on your uh, vertical illuminator as a reflected light source, or it can go on the uh, transmitted light source. Um, so what are the benefits of this four light LED illuminator? One of three, it has four lights. So if you look over here on the left, if you have the illuminator, your graphic user interface will look like this. You'll be able to control the four lights. You can control all the lights together, just like a regular 2D microscope, or you have the option of controlling each of these pie-shaped illuminated lights, either together, left and right together. You can put both right ones together to make a right eye view, both left together to make a left eye view. That'll make a stereo picture. Or you can do individually set each of these and that tells you the intensity of the light. So what this illuminator does that enhances contrast, increases resolution, improves depth of field, and produces real-time stereo 3D. So let's look at this. The first thing it is, it's a powerful contrast enhancement system. Uh, and this is really important because it produces highlights and shadows on specimens that allows you to get better visibility allows you to see it where otherwise you couldn't really see very much. So let's look at this radial area with bright field. This has got all four lights on it, basically one, you know, one standard, and this is a bright field image. And you can barely see what's happening. But look what happens when you turn one single oblique light on from the northwest. Now all of a sudden, wow, it's like night and day. Now you can see every little bit of, the, uh, uh, of these little microorganisms with good, good contrast and, and the stacking gives you incredible depth of field. So here's an example closer up. Let's look at the same thing with a higher power lens. So here 
you can see we have all the lights on. So this is, and when we slide this up, all these other ones, they're ganged together. So all these are sliding up at the same time because you're using them as a single conventional light source when they all go up. So this is what you see. Uh, now, when you go, when, when you just go, you turn these off and then you just turn on the Northwest light by pulling that up, watch what happens. Now just the Northwest light, whoops. Now just the Northwest light is on. You can see that light, that is off. This slider is up, all the other ones are off. And now you get a beautiful high contrast, high power view of the radial area. And it will also make the rotational 3D video. So now without glasses, you see all the details in 3D. You see the foreground from the background. So another thing that the 3D illuminator does is it increases, it, it increases the resolution of the lens you happen to be using. And it does that by allowing the objective lens to capture higher order diffraction wavelengths. I want to spend just a little bit of time telling you about this. Now, to say that we're going to increase resolution, I mean, we all know that the limit of resolution and magnification was reached 130 years ago by Ernst Abbe from Zeiss. And he came up with the, with the formula of the distance. And this is the minimum, D means the minimum distance between two points. That's what the definition of resolution. What is the smallest distance between two points that you can still see them as two points and not one point? Because if they're too small, you only see them as one point. So the resolution is 1.22 times the wavelength of light, lambda, divided by the NA, the numerical aperture of the objective lens plus the numerical aperture of the condenser lens. Now, most people write this formula two times the NA, but that doesn't take into consideration that the importance of the of the NA of the condenser lens. And when you use oblique illumination, you can actually increase that. And I'm going to show you how that happens. So here is a picture of a striated muscle cell. Uh, this is some, you know, conventional muscle. It's a high, it's, a, it's probably taken to the 40X lens, it looks like. And you can see the striations. And these striations come closer and farther apart as the muscle contracts. They're kind of like accordion in a way. Well, if you take the eyepiece, you're looking at this in your microscope and you remove the eyepiece out of the right hand side of your viewing uh, head, this is what you're going to see. You see a diffraction pattern. What happens is, and this was shown by Ernst Abbe 130 years ago, that, that, the, the, uh, that the specimen produces a diffraction pattern at the pupil inside of the objective lens. So here you can see there's the zero order of the diffraction pattern. There's the first order and there's the second order. There's the first order on the other side and the second order on the other side. And here's what happens. As these spacings or distances in the object get smaller and smaller, the diffraction wavelets spread out farther and farther. And at one point, you don't see the diffraction wavelets anymore. And that's when you've reached the limit of resolution. When they say diffraction limits the resolution of the light microscope, it's because you have to see the diffraction wavelets in order to see the resolution. So here's an object that is right at the limit of resolution with a light microscope. This is clear sigma angulatum. It's used to test how good your microscope is. If you have a really good microscope, it should look like this. Um, and if you take the right side, eyepiece out of the right side, you're going to see the zero order and then the first order. Now, these spaces are so small, you don't see the second order because it's out, it falls outside of the objective aperture. Now, notice that I've had to reduce the you see the first order? I had to close down the iris of the condenser lens in order to see these, what, these wavelets. Otherwise, the zero order would overpower the wavelets. So this is an interesting thing about oblique illumination. It attenuates the zero order so that more information from the wavelets is used. Um, so look at this. Let's get to a diatom that's below the resolution of a light microscope. So this is Amphipleura pellucida. It's got markings that are 250 by 200 nanometer markings. Uh, uh, and if you have, if, if you're just looking at it with a dry lens, if, if you're not using a 1.4 NA oil objective and a 1.4 NA oil condenser, this is what you're going to see. You're not going to see any markings. You're just going to see the outline of the diatom. If you use a really good lens, 1.4 NA, and you put oil on the condenser and on the and on the uh, the, uh, the the objective, you're going to see these lines. But if you if you use oblique illumination and you tilt the illumination so that the zero order 
is, is, is out to one side and the first order is out to the other side, you pick up an additional order of, of you, you pick up the uh, diffraction wavelet for the 200 nanometer markings. And here with oblique illumination, now you can see that those lines actually consist of little dots. Here's an example of the diatom that I showed you uh, that had just one order of diffraction wavelet. Uh, so, so this is the uh, pleurisenca agulatum. But look, we bring the zero order all the way out to the side. So it doesn't overpower the, the input from the wavelets. So now you get, instead of just one, the, the, the first order, you're getting the first order and the second order. And if you bring in multiple oblique lights from this direction, and from this direction, now those you, you make two diffraction wavelets that interfere with one another that increases the resolution throughout the XY plane even further. So now what's strange about this is, is not only does it increase resolution, but it increases depth of field, which is kind of counterproductive. Let me try and show you why this is. If you have a setup where you have your condenser lens irises open, and here's your objective lens, you're gonna, that's going to be the best resolution that you're going to have for whatever you're looking at there. Now, if you close down the iris in your condenser lens, now all of a sudden what happens is you've reduced the cone of illumination and you've created more contrast and more depth of field. The depth of field increased because the F number increased. You see, this is a higher F number than this. So, you, so you've increased the depth of field. But look what happens here. If you if you close down the condenser, but bring it over to the side as an oblique illumination beam, now you have the higher F number, so you increase the depth of field, yet you do not lose the resolution. In fact, you slightly increase the resolution via the higher order wavelength. So this is particularly important for live cells, um, because in live cells, you can't stain them. You need to see them unstained. And this produces the visualization of closure of the neural tube. I took this picture when I first came across these ideas, and it allows you to see great depth of field and the closure of the neural tube. And the great thing is that it does it in plastic dishes without using DIC. People like to grow cells in plastic dishes because they're much more convenient. But DIC uses polarization light, and plastic destroys the polarization. Uh, so this is the real advantage for living cells. Here's an example of putting the illuminator on a reflective light source. So here's all lights on. That's just a little bump on a on a on a on a metal surface. Uh, now you put the you, you use just one oblique illuminator. Look, all of a sudden you've increased the depth of field, and now you've created highlights and shadows. You come from a different direction. You create highlights and shadows from a different direction, which allows you to see and understand other aspects of these structures. So uh, that kind of winds it up. Uh, I want to, if there's any questions, I want to open them up. But I know that one of the first questions is, of course, is what is the cost of panfocal microscopy? So I just wanted to show you that. Basically, the, pencil, the, the panfocal software, which you download uh, from Edge, is $4,000. Uh, the prior scientific Z-Focus drive for compound microscopes, and that includes uh, the controller and the drive and and the sleeve. Uh, you just tell us what microscope you have, and we have, we, uh, uh, we we send it with the appropriate sleeve. That's thirty four hundred. Now, if you have a stereo microscope instead of a compound microscope, you can get the stereo micro version here at four thousand. And there's also a version for the Nikon measuring microscope. And then, if you're interested in the optional three D illumination system, that's six thousand five hundred. Uh, these are the various microscopes that the sleeves match up with. You just pick the one that you have. If yours isn't listed here, uh, we can easily uh, 3D print a sleeve for you. So the sleeve is not matching it up with your microscope is, is not going to be a problem. So that's what 3D pan focal microscopy is all about. Uh, so I do, do we have any questions? So the question is, can the illuminator be helped with fingerprint analysis? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer, but the person who asked that, if you'd be kind enough to send me a sample, um, and I will photograph it for you, and let's see what it does. I think that's really interesting. I'd really like to see uh, how that would do. I've never tried that.
Okay, so if there's any, not any other questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back to Al at EMS. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Gary. That is quite informative and always very visually uh, stimulating. Uh, I thank everyone for attending today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to. Uh, us at Electron Microscopy Sciences or Gary directly uh, at the information on the screen. Thanks for your time and take care.